Chapter Nine of the Gold Sickle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gold Sickle by Eugene Sue, translated by Daniel De Leon. The Forest of Karnak. The call for assembling that was issued to the tribes at noon had run from mouth to mouth, from village to village, from town to town. It was heard all over Breton Gaul. Towards evening, the tribes proceeded en masse, men, women, and children, to the forest of Karnak, the same as Joel and his family. The moon at her fullest on that night shone radiant amid the stars in the firmament. After having marched through the dark and the lighted spots of the forest, the assembling multitude finally arrived at the shores of the sea. The sacred stones of Karnak rose there in nine long avenues. They are sacred stones. They are the gigantic pillars of a temple that has the sky for its vault. In the measure that the tribes drew nearer to the place, their solemnity deepened. At the extremity of the avenue, the three stones of the sacrificial altar were ranged in a semicircle close to the shore. Behind the mass of people rose the deep and brooding forest. Before them extended the boundless sea. Above them spread the starry firmament. The tribes did not step beyond the last avenue of Karnak. They left a wide space between themselves and the altar. The large crowd remained silent. At the feet of the sacrificial stones rose three pyres. The center one, the largest of the three, was ornamented with long white veils striped with purple. It was also ornamented with ash, oak, and birch tree branches arranged in mystical order. The pyre to the right was somewhat less high, but was also ornamented with green branches beside sheafs of wheat. On it lay the body of Armel, who had been killed in loyal combat. It was almost hidden under green and fruit-bearing boughs. The left pyre was surmounted with a hollow bunch of twisted osiers, bearing the resemblance of a human body of gigantic stature. The sound of cymbals and harps was presently heard from the distance. The male and female druids, together with the virgins of the Isle of Sen, were approaching the sacrificial place. At the head of the procession marched the bards, dressed in long white tunics that were held round their waists by brass belts. Their temples were wreathed in oak leaves. They sang while playing upon their harps, God, Gaul, and her heroes. They were followed by the Ewags charged with the sacrifices and carrying torches and axes. They led in their midst and in chains Daolus, the murderer, who was to be executed. Behind these marched the Druids, themselves clad in their purple-striped white robes, and their temples also wreathed in oak leaves. In their midst was Julian, happy and proud. Julian, who was glad to leave this world in order to rejoin his friend Armel and journey in his company over the unknown worlds. Finally came the married female druids, clad in white tunics with gold belts, and the nine virgins of the Isle of Sen, clad in their black tunics, their belts of brass, their arms bare, their green chaplets, and their gold harps. Hina walked at the head of the latter. Her eyes looked for her father, her mother, and her relatives. Joel, Margaret, and their family had been placed in the front rank of the crowd, they soon recognized their daughter, and their hearts went out to her. The druids ranked themselves beside the sacrificial stones. The bards ceased chanting. One of the Ewags then said to the crowd that all who wished to be remembered to people whom they had loved, and who were no longer here, could deposit their letters and offerings on the pyres. A large number of relatives and friends of those who had long been traveling yonder thereupon piously approached the pyres and deposited letters flowers and other souvenirs that were to reappear in the other worlds the same as the souls of the bodies that were about to dissolve in brilliant flames were to reappear in a new body nobody 
However, not one single person deposited aught on the pyre of the murderer. As proud and joyful as Julian was, Daolus was crestfallen and frightened. Julian had everything to hope for from the continuance of a life that had been uniformly pure and just. The murderer had everything to fear from the continuance of a life that was stained with crime. After all the offerings for the departed ones were deposited on the pyres, a profound silence followed. The Ewags led Daolus in chains to the osier effigy. Despite the pitiful cries of the condemned man, he was pinioned and placed at the foot of the pyre, and the Ewags remained near him, axes in hand. Taliesin, the oldest of all the druids, an old man with long white beard, made a sign to one of the bards, who thereupon struck his three-stringed harp, and intonated the following chant, after pointing to the murderer. This man is of the tribe of Morlek. He killed Huan of the same tribe. Did he kill him like a brave man face to face with equal weapons? No. Daolus killed Huan like a coward. At the noon hour, Huan was asleep under a tree. Daolus approached him on tiptoe, axe in hand, and killed his victim with one blow. Little Eric of the same tribe, who happened to be in a nearby tree picking fruit, saw the murder and him who committed it. On the evening of the same day, the Ewag seized Daolus in his tribe, brought him before the druids of Karnak, and confronted by Eric, he confessed his crime, whereupon the oldest of the druids said, In the name of Hesus, he who is because he is, in the name of Teutates, who presides over journeys in this world and in the others, here, the expiatory blood of the murderer is agreeable to Hesus. You are about to be born again in other worlds. Your new life will be terrible, because you were cruel and cowardly. You will die to be reborn in still greater wretchedness forever and ever through all eternity. Become, on the contrary, from the moment that you are reborn, brave and good, despite the sufferings that you will endure, and you will then die happy to be reborn yonder, thus forever and ever, throughout all eternity. The bard then addressed himself to the murderer, who emitted fearful cries of terror. Thus spoke the venerable druid. Daolus, you are about to die, and to meet your victim. He is waiting for you. He is waiting for you. When the bard pronounced these words, a shudder went through the assembled crowd. The fearful thought of meeting in the next world alive, him who was killed in this, made them all tremble. The bard proceeded, turning towards the pyre. Daolus, you are about to die. It is a glorious thing to see the face of a brave and just person at the moment when he or she voluntarily quits this world for some sacred cause. They love at the moment of their departure to see the tender looks of farewell of their parents and friends. Cowards like yourself, Daolus, are unworthy of taking a last look at the just. Hence, Daolus, you will die and burn, hidden in that envelope of osier, the effigy of a man as you have become since the commission of the murder. And the bard cried, In the name of Hesus, in the name of Teutates, glory, glory to the brave, shame, shame on the coward. All the bards struck upon their harps and their cymbals, and cried in chorus, Glory, glory to the brave, shame, shame on the coward. And Ewag then took up a sacred knife, cut off the murderer's life, and cast his body inside of the huge osier effigy of a man. The pyre was set on fire. The harps and cymbals struck up in chorus, and all the tribes repeated aloud the last words of the bard, Shame on the coward! Soon the murderer's pyre was a raging mass of flame, within which was seen for a moment the effigy of a man like a giant on fire. The flames lighted the tops of the oaks of the forest, the colossal stones of Karnak, and even the vast expanse of the sea, while the moon inundated the space with its divine light. A few minutes later there was nothing left but a heap of ashes where the pyre of Daolus had stood. Julian was then seen ascending 
with radiant mien the pyre where laid the body of armel his friend his pledged brother julian had on his holiday clothes a blouse of fine material striped white and blue held around his waist by an embroidered leather belt from which hung his knife his caped cloak of brown wool was held by a brooch over his left shoulder an oak crown decked his manly head he held in his hand a nosegay of vervain he looked serene and bold hardly had he ascended the pyre when again the harps and cymbals struck up and the bard chanted who is this he is a brave man it is julian the laborer julian of the family of joel the bren of the tribe of karnak he fears the gods and all love him he is good he is industrious he is brave he killed armel not in hate but in a contest in loyal combat buckler on arm sword in hand like a true breton gaul who loves to display his bravery and does not fear death armel having departed julian who had pledged brotherhood to him wishes to depart also and join his friend glory to julian faithful to the teachings of the druids he knows that the creatures of the all-powerful never die and his pure and noble blood julian now offers up to hesus glory hope and happiness to julian he has been a good just and brave man he will be reborn still happier still juster still braver and ever onward from world to world julian will be reborn his soul being ever reincarnated in a new body the same as the body that here puts on new clothes o gauls ye proud souls to whom death does not exist come come remove your eyes from this earth rise to the sublimity of heaven see see at your feet the abyss of space dotted by these myriads of mortals as are all of us and whom Teutates guides incessantly from the world that they have lived in towards the world that they are next to inhabit oh what unknown worlds and marvelous we shall journey through with our friends and our relatives that have preceded us and with those whom we shall precede no we are not mortals our infinite lives are numbered by myriads and myriads of centuries just as are numbered by myriads and myriads the stars in the firmament mysterious worlds ever different ever new that we are successively to inhabit let those who fear death who faithful to the false gods of the greeks the romans and the jews believe that man lives only once and that after that stripped of his body the happy or unhappy soul remains eternally in the same hell or the same paradise ay they are bound to fear death who believe that when man quits this life he finds immobility in eternity we gauls have the right knowledge of god we hold the secret of death man is immortal both in body and soul our destiny from world to world is to see and learn to the end that at each of these journeys if we have led wicked and impure lives we may purify ourselves and become better still better if we have been just and good and thus from new birth to new birth man rises incessantly towards perfection as endless as his life happy therefore are the brave who voluntarily leave this world for other regions where they will ever see new and marvelous sights in the company of those whom they have loved happy therefore happy the brave julian he is about to meet again with his friend and with him see and know what none of us has yet seen or known and what all of us shall see and know happy julian glory glory to julian and all the bards and all the druids the female druids and the virgins of the isle of sen repeated in chorus to the sound of the harps and the cymbals happy happy julian glory to julian and all the tribes feeling the thrill of the curiosity of death and certain that they all would eventually become acquainted with the marvels of the other worlds repeated with their thousands of voices happy julian happy julian standing erect upon his pyre his face radiant and at his feet 
the body of Armel, Julian raised his inspired eyes towards the brilliant moon, opened his blouse, drew his long knife, held up the nosegay of her vein to heaven with his left hand, and with his right firmly plunged his knife into his breast, uttering as he did so in a strong voice, Happy, happy am I, I am to join Armel. The pyre was immediately lighted. Julian raised for a last time his nosegay of vervain to heaven, and then vanished in the midst of the blinding flames, while the chants of the bards and the clang of harp and cymbals resounded far and wide. In their impatience to see and know the mysteries of the other world, a large number of men and women of the tribes rushed towards Julian's pyre for the purpose of departing with him and of offering to Hesus an immense hecatomb with their bodies. But Taliesin, the eldest of the Druids, ordered the Ewags to restrain and to hold these faithful people back. He cried out to them, Enough blood has flown without that which is still to flow. But the hour has come when the blood of Gaul should flow only for freedom. The blood that is shed for liberty is also an agreeable offering to the all-powerful. It was not without great effort that the Ewags prevented the threatened rush of voluntary human sacrifices. The pyre of Julian and Armel burned until the flames had nothing more to feed upon. Again, profound silence fell upon the crowd. Hina, the virgin of the Isle of Sen, had ascended the third pyre. Joel and Margaret, their three sons, Gilhern, Albinic, and Michael, Gilhern's wife and little children, all of whom so dearly loved Ina, all her relatives and all the members of her tribe, held one another in a close embrace, and said to one another, There is Hina, there is our Hina. As the Virgin of the Isle of Sen stood upon the pyre that was ornamented with white veils, greens, and flowers, the crowds of the tribes cried in one voice, How beautiful she is, how holy! Joel writes it now down, in all sincerity. His daughter Hina was indeed very beautiful, as she stood erect on the pyre, lighted by the mellow light of the moon, and resplendent in her black tunic, her blonde hair, and her green chaplet, while her arms, whiter than ivory, embraced her gold harp. The bards ordered silence. The Virgin of the Isle of Sen sang in a voice as pure as her own soul. The daughter of Joel and Margaret comes to offer gladly her life as a sacrifice to Hesus. O oh, all-powerful, from the stranger deliver the soil of our father. Gauls of Brittany, you have the lance and the sword. The daughter of Joel and Margaret has but her blood. She offers it voluntarily to Hesus. O oh, almighty God, render invincible the Gallic lance and sword. O oh, Hesus, Take my blood, it is yours. Save our sacred fatherland. The eldest of the female druids stood all this while on the pyre behind Hina with the sacred knife in her hand. When Hina's chant was ended, the knife glistened in the air and struck the virgin of the Isle of Sen. Her mother and her brothers, all the members of her tribe and her father Joel, saw Hina fall upon her knees cross her arms, turn her celestial face towards the moon, and cry with a still sonorous voice, Hesus, Hesus, by the blood that flows, mercy for Gaul. Gauls, by this blood that flows, victory to our arms. And thus the sacrifice of Fina was consummated amidst the religious admiration of the tribes all repeated the last words of the brave virgin hesus mercy for gaul gauls victory to our arms several young men being fired with enthusiasm by the heroic example and beauty of hena sought to kill themselves upon her pyre in order to be reborn with her the ewags held them back the flames soon enveloped the pyre and hena vanished in their dazzling splendor a few minutes later there was nothing left of the virgin and her pyre but a heap of ashes. A high wind sat in from the sea and dispersed the atoms. 
the virgin of the isle of sen brilliant and pure as the flame that consumed her had vanished into space to be reborn and to await beyond for the arrival of those whom she had loved the cymbals and harps resounded anew and the chief of the bards struck up the chant to arms ye gauls to arms the innocent blood of a virgin flowed for your sakes and shall not yours flow for the fatherland to arms the romans are here strike gauls strike at their heads strike hard see the enemy's blood flow like a stream it rises up to your knees courage strike hard gauls strike the romans still harder harder still you see the enemy's blood extend like a lake it rises up to your chests courage strike still harder gauls strike the romans strike harder still you will rest tomorrow tomorrow gaul will be free let today from the loire to the ocean but one cry resound to arms as if carried away by the breath of war all the tribes dispersed running to their arms the moon had gone down dark night set in but from all parts of the woods from the bottoms of the valleys from the tops of the hills where the signal fires were burning a thousand voices echoed and re-echoed the chant of the bards to arms strike gauls strike hard at the romans to arms the above truthful account of all that happened at our poor home on the birthday of my glorious hena a day that also saw her heroic sacrifice that account has been written by me joel the bren of the tribe of karnak at the last moon of october of the first year that julius caesar came to invade gaul i write it upon the rolls of white skin that my glorious daughter hena gave me as a keepsake and my eldest son gilhern has attached to them the keepsake he received from her the mystic gold sickle of the virgin druid priestess let the two ever remain together after me my eldest son gilhern shall carefully preserve both the writing and the emblem and after gilhern the sons of his sons are charged to transmit them from generation to generation to the end that our family may for all time preserve green the memory of hena the virgin of the isle of sen end of chapter nine and end of the gold sickle by eugene sue translated by daniel de leon